What's up? What's up? What's up? We are back. It is another edition of The Breakdown, your favorite duo coming at you live from the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. Your co-host, Max Friedman, Trademark MMA, joined as always by the man, the king of the Netherlands, perhaps, Marcel Dorf. Big Marcel, coming at you. What's going on? Hey, what's up, man? Great to be back. And uh, yeah, man, all good. Uh, pretty hot in here right now, but um, I'm happy uh, I'm done with work for today because it was a pretty tough day. And uh, yeah, how are you doing, my man? Things are good. And apologies to the fans last week. Uh, could not coordinate on a time for the show, given uh, some issues going on back home. But we're good now. Um, Big Marcel, how hot are we talking, though? Because it's 89 degrees Fahrenheit over here. Well, what's the temperature over there? Something same, I think. But uh, yeah, man, I, I've worked like the whole day in the sun with glowing on my and that's just very tough, man. And that's uh, I'm I'm just happy I'm inside now. So uh, that's why I have. Well, I hope you're wearing lots of sunscreen, dude. I have everything down in here, man. I mean, if I if I do everything up, it's very sunny. So I have everything down. I'm done with that for today. Well, got to make that money to pay the bills. So glad you're done with work, and now it's time to real have some real fun. Talk talk some UFC San Antonio coming up this weekend. Um, but before we get into that. Let's take a look back at last week, UFC Sacramento. And for the second week in a row, my co-host on the other side of the world picks up the win. Seven and five on the night for Big Marcel. Also picked up an underdog and a performance bonus. The underdog being Jonathan Martinez. Performance bonus being Jermaine Durandamy, his fellow countrywoman. Um, bringing his total to 147 and 124 for the year. Uh, modest six and six night for me. Now at 159 and 1112, I did pick up both an underdog and a performance bonus. The aforementioned Jermaine Durandamy, my underdog of the night, Benito Lopez on the right side of a split decision there. I'm still 12 behind you. Still 12 behind, but we're only halfway through the year, Big Marcel. We got a whole yeah. other year, whole other half the year to go. It's just awful. <laughs> Let's see what happens in the upcoming months. Uh, maybe it's 24. <laughs> <laughs> could go one way, could go the other. A lot of, lot of season left, if you will. But I uh, just want to remind everyone to subscribe to the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network wherever you get your podcasts, um, Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud. When that show gets uploaded, it will go directly to whatever podcast medium you listen to. Some really great content between the links. MMA's version of ESPN's Around the Horn, hosted by Mike Heck, who writes for about eight different uh, media outlets these days. Um, great panelists, Davidson Baker, Craig Allen, Keith Schillen. This week's episode, absolutely hilarious if you haven't heard it yet. Uh, the Sunday morning cornerman, John Franklin, joins the panel. Um, and some great banter there. Speaking of John Franklin, the newest member to the Loudmouth MMA Network team, him and Keith combined for the Sunday morning cornerman show. Just a great recap of the UFC fight from the night before. Um, also of MMA yesterday, the Not Safe for Work MMA show, Fred Kirby, Kyle Steele. Fred Kirby's rants, man, those are unbelievable. He is he is one funny dude. Uh, Big Marcel, what's your favorite show on the network other than the breakdown, of course? <laughs> I like I really liked the uh, man uh, between the links. I really like that one. So uh, that's, such a uh, unique concept. Love the love that, and they have great panelists, really knowledgeable. And Mike does a great job running the the point there. What's your favorite? No, yes, I love between the links um, for pure entertainment purposes. I think not safe for work, man. That thing is so funny. Kyle and Fred just let it fly. They have no filter in that one. So that's, <laughs> that's fun. But as far as like a true MMA podcast, a unique approach, like something that's going to, I'm going to enjoy as a fan between the links by far. But of course the breakdown is, is the most fun I have. Cause I get to talk to you. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Looking ahead, though, you. UFC on ESPN4, UFC San Antonio comes up this Saturday, July 20th, 2019 at the AT&T Center in San Antonio, Texas. Should be a hot one and uh, quite a great few fights on the bill. This one is all televised, but we kick things off in the prelims in the men's bantamweight divi division. Domingo Pilarte taking on Felipe Colares. Pilarte minus 320 on the betting line. Kolaris 
plus 260 in his sophomore UFC outing. Man, I am pumped. We're going to finally get to see Pilarte making his UFC debut. Uh, he won that Dana White Tuesday night contract uh, last season, beating Vince Morales. Had a bout with Brian Kelleher get scrapped due to injury. Uh, the guy's only 29, five-fight win streak. Big southpaw uh, standing in there for a really big for a bantamweight. Meanwhile, on the other side, Kalaris eight and one, somewhat of a lackluster UFC debut. Dropped that split, that decision loss to Gilda Freitas in Brazil. Granted, it was on short notice and up a weight class, but now he heads back down to one thirty five. So, got to think you'll see a better Kalaris at his natural weight class as well as with a full camp. Big Marcel, break this curtain jerker down for us. Yeah, man, it's uh, like you said, Domingo Pilarte, who I finally going to see him. He was supposed to fight Brian Keller last year, and uh, that didn't go through. Um, beat Vince Morales in the Contender Series was a pretty pretty good fight, I think. Um, what well, was actually pr pretty back and forth, if I remember correctly. I think Morales did well as well, but uh, Domingo won by a rear naked choke. Um, yeah, Domingo Pilarte, he, 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 was, he did some uh, good in the regional scene, man. Legacy uh, FC and later LFA after Legacy and uh, RFA. Um, what do you say? Merged together. Um, the, Col Colares, he's uh, he coming from Jungle Fight. Uh, Jungle Fight always uh, producing some good talent. He was uh, the featherweight champion over there, now dropping to uh, to, to Bantamweight to fight uh, Domingo Pilarte. It's tough to say because he had such a, I think, a really bad debut against uh, Gerardo de Freitas. But, uh, man, I, I have to favor Domingo Pilarte here. I think a unanimous decision, but I think it will be very competitive and a good fight. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm excited to see what Domingo Pilarte can bring to this Bantamweight division. I love his size and I love the way he moves. Just that big, looping southpaw coming at you. Give me Pilarte on a decision as well. Next up, we stay at 135 pounds in the bantamweight division. Mario Bautista taking on Jinsu Son. Son out of South Korea is a minus 200 favorite. Bautista is a plus 170 underdog. Jinsu Son. Many might not know who he is, but this guy's a maniac when he steps into the cage. Unbelievable debut against Piotr Jan. I mean, that guy ate hundreds of shots and kept a smile on his face. Big Marcel, what would you think of that debut? Yeah, man, it was crazy, man. He got uh, immediately got uh, like uh, he is the little brother of the Korean zombie, you know uh, how we fought. It's uh, it was a great fight. He got fight of the night as well. So that I think that's it enough. And that wasn't even on the main card back then. That was the future prelim, I think, on that card. So that was a great fight. And uh, you want me to break it down? Just give you a little context. Son is 26. He's the former deep bantamweight champion. He was actually supposed to fight Taruto Ishihara at UFC 234, but a family issue took him out of that fight. So his countryman, Kyung Ho Kong, stepped up, took a, took his place in that one. Um, Batista, though, 25, comes from the MMA lab. Might have been a bit rushed in the UFC, but nonetheless, he is here. He is 0-1. Big Marcel, break this thing down. I'm shocked with what you said. I didn't even know Jin Susan was supposed to fight at UFC 234, man. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, what do I think? Um, he, he did well and deep. He was a champ over there. Like you said, Mario Bautista, he fought in LFA and in Combate. But, uh, man, how can you go against Jin Susan, man? He gave Pat Patroyan. He, he, he got beat, and it was a pretty decisive one, I think. But he did great in that fight. He, he kept coming, but he got he got hit with some good shots. And Pedro, Peter Jan is uh, Piotr Jan, I have to say, is uh, top five. So, um, man, how do I not go with Jin Susan? Taking him, man, probably by, let's say, a TKO in the second round would be fun. Yeah, Son, just perhaps the most impressive UFC debut in a losing manner this uh, that I can think of in recent history. Um, I expect Bautista to come out much better. This fight is not on short notice. It is not against a top 10 opponent like Corey Sanhagen, but uh, I got Son too. I'm going to take him via TKO here as well. And I now, and that'll be in the third round, not the second round like you have. When um, you think about it, they both debut against top 10 guys. Yeah, that's something. A third straight UFC bantamweight fight. Ray Borg takes on the newcomer, Gabriel Silva. Borg is a minus 235 favorite. The comeback on Silva is plus 195. The Taz Mexican devil, Ray Borg, formerly challenged for the UFC flyweight title. Um, somehow he's still only 25, but he is coming off a loss to Casey Kenny in March. That was his third different opponent for that fight. Um, 
Gabriel Silva, meanwhile, UFC debut, 7-0, and the younger brother of Eric Silva, discovered on the most recent episode of Dana White's looking for a fight. Um, seems like a pretty well-rounded guy. Definitely packs a punch for 135. We saw that knockout on uh, on the show. Um, how to, hard to pick in this one. Big Marcel, where you at? I actually want to say I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty bummed about Dana White looking for a fight, man. I mean, you record an episode three months ago and you think nobody's going to know who you sign. And then the guy gets a matchup and then you show the Dana White looking for a fight two months later. How does that make sense? That that takes everything away from the, from the episode, in my opinion. Yeah, I really liked it when they would announce the fight at the end of the episode as exactly. the as the whole climax to it. Yeah, when they did that with uh, Randy Brown against Matt Dwyer, I remember that Cody East against Walt Harris. Yep, that was good, man. But now it's just like, man, oh cool, Gabriel Silva. Oh, they went to that uh, event. Oh, so he got signed after Dana White looking for uh, for a fight. Oh, okay, and that's why he's fighting. Yeah, two months later you get the episode. Doesn't make sense, but good. I will stop with my rant here. Um, Ray Borg, man, his last fight. Uh, maybe you don't agree with me, but I think he won against Casey Kenny. Um, that's it was awfully opinion. close. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have felt either way if it had he gotten the other. Hadn't he gotten the call? It was close, but I still think Ray deserved to win that fight. But uh, Gabriel Silva, uh, very impressive in this LFA bout against Jay Kafferman, who was undefeated before that. Um, man, you you basically Bork is a veteran man at 25. So you're gonna choose between a, a seasoned veteran and basically someone. Who is who is also not any very same 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 age basically, but uh, he hasn't fought the same competition as Borg did. That said, I'm going with Ray Borg by unanimous decision. Have you heard what I said? No. Hmm? Sorry. You you didn't hear what I say, right? No, I heard what you said. Ray Borg, unanimous decision. Okay, you because you you're, you're froze for me, so uh, I don't oh, know. Okay. If you're... Sorry about that. I'll I'll go video on video off again. Um, <laughs> Ray Borg, unanimous decision on my end as well. I just think he's going to straighten things up a little bit, control the fight um, from bell to bell in this one. Finally, our first fight out of the men's bantamweight division. Stop copying my picks. I'm done with it now. Not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to be split on this next one too. Uh, I think so. <laughs> Number five ranked Roxanne Mataferi takes on number six ranked Jennifer Maya. Pretty close betting lines here. Maya, the ever so slight minus 120 favorite. Mataferi, even money underdog in this one. Uh, Roxy, two and two in this return, but coming off an absolute huge win over Antonina Shevchenko. And if you recall, Big Marcel, you were pretty confident that Shevchenko number two was going to get it done there. And I believe I picked that one correctly. I was pretty um, confident I was gonna get gonna do a pee break. I think. <laughs> Very well rounded on the ground is Roxanne Mataferi, still working on the striking, but definitely improved since joining Syndicate MMA overall. Meanwhile, Maya one and one in the UFC since coming over from Invicta, coming off a win over Alexis Davis, holds a win over Roxanne Mataferi. Actually, it was a split decision in 2016. Big Marcel, we got. Two former Invicta veterans here. Who's going to get it done? Yeah, it's actually a pretty tough pick here, I think, because uh, Roxanne Motherfarer, we all know she has so much. Uh, how do you say that? I always can't kind of get the word in English. She, experience, there you have it. She has so much experience. Uh, Jennifer Maya. If I can remember correctly, that Alexis Davis fight was pretty controversial or wasn't? Yeah, it was very close. Yeah. So, um, ah, man, it's 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 so difficult to pick this one, man. The first fight between them was a split decision for Jennifer Maya. Um, man, I, I, I'm taking Jennifer Maya, but I'm not sure, and I'm sure you're taking Roxanne here, but I'm taking Jennifer Maya to get a split decision win here. And I'm pretty shocked, by the way, that Jennifer Maya is all up to number six or five in the rankings, man, with only one win. Yeah, only one win over Alexis Davis, but a very competitive fight with Liz Carmouche, who is now the number one contender for uh, champion Valentina Shevchenko's title. Um, I'm going Mata Ferry on the other side, split decision, like your breakdown. But uh, I don't know. I'm, I I feel like Roxy is just uh, she she's fighting a lot differently than 
than she has in the past. Um, seems like much smarter in there ever since that that fight with um, who is it, Barb Honchak? Yeah, let's put it this way: I would be cool to see her win again, man. I think uh, who doesn't like her, you know? No, no, gotta gotta love the happy warrior. No. Switch. <laughs> Heading up to. 205 for this next one. I almost said 185, but Sam Alvey now competes in the UFC light heavyweight division. Uh, he takes on Brazilian Clayton Farias de Abreu. Uh, Alvey is a smite, slight underdog, actually, plus 140. Uh, only one fight for Clayton Farias. He is a minus 160 favorite. Uh, the major vet in Sam Alvey here, 18th UFC fight coming up uh, in this one. Coming off back-to-back -back TKO losses, though, Jimmy Crute and Little Nog. Antonio Ogerio Noguera. The Crute stoppage, controversial to some, not to me. I thought it was a just stoppage. Cleats and Farias, meanwhile, second UFC outing, a loss to Hamazan Emeev in his UFC debut. Uh, seems more of a submission guy. On the other side, for me, Alvi seems like he doesn't take the punch as well as he used to, but not sure he's going to be as tested on the feet in this one as he was in his last two. Big Marcel, where do you see this light heavyweight fight going? Yeah, man, I think uh, there was uh, some uh, real uh, high between Klitz and Abreu when he fought uh, Ankalaev in, uh, what was that? Uh, it was in St. Petersburg. Um, yeah. I think uh, I'm really high on Klitz and Abreu. Besides, uh, he didn't do well in his debut. But I think I, I told you before, man, Ankalaev, he, he's pretty good. But we, also, we both picked Abreu in that one. So I was pretty surprised. But uh, Ankalaev is really good, and uh, man, Sam Alvey, uh, not not that great in his last fights. He got he got finished twice, like you said. And um, I always have the feeling, man, that Alvey has to have an opponent which is very aggressive to him, so he can he can put a counter strike. And I think uh, the opponents seeing that lately. So, uh, man, I see Klitson Abreu winning this one, man. I I would be surprised if he doesn't, and I take him with a. Submission, let's say uh, a rear naked choke in the second round. Yeah, I, I really agree with your analysis, Alvi, counter striker, but man, he's in danger of losing his third straight. And just knowing the type of gamer and competitor he is, I don't think he does. I, I can't see him losing this fight. He usually shows some solid takedown defense. Granted, Hamazana may have exposed, might have exposed him a little bit in their fight, but give me, um, give me Alvi on this one. Uh, you need, uh, I'll take uh, TKO. TKO in the second. And you know what? I just realized it was it was his fight against. Didn't Sam Alvey face Hamazana Mayev at 185? Yeah. 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 Okay. And it's, uh, That's what I. Yeah, Alvey yeah. and Mayev and Ankalaev. I just mixed up. Yeah, I, I was nervous that I said Magomed Ankalaev, who fought Clinton Abreu in his UFC debut. All right, we're good. <laughs> Got it right. Um, yeah. Here we go. Women's bantamweights on deck. Number 10 ranked, Irene Aldana takes on number 6, Raquel Pennington. And the lower ranked fighter, Irene Aldana, minus 155 favorite, Pennington plus 135. Uh, Pennington lost back-to-back -back fights as well. Amanda Nunez and Jermaine Durandamy. Uh, no one will ever question Rocky's toughness, though, but... Um, I kind of get the sense that her better performances might be behind her. Meanwhile, on the other side of things, Aldana seems like she's on the rise. Started off her career 0-2, but has since really turned things around nicely. Three impressive UFC wins. Finished Betch Cohea last time out. Big Marcel, where are you at with this one? Man, this is such a tough fight again to pick because his, uh, Pennington's last two fights are arguably against the two best bantamweight, uh, women bantamweights in the, in the division. You know, and uh, Aldana, she won the last three fights, but against lesser good competition, in my opinion. So, man, uh, such a tough fight to pick because I think Aldana is good standing. Pennington is pretty good standing. Um, this is pretty much a split decision overall again. And uh, we all know how tough Aldana is. She keeps punching even when she has two eyes closed. Uh, Pennington is super tough. Man, this, this is probably one of the most difficult picks on the whole card, in my opinion. I think many people will go with Aldana. But, uh, man, I feel Pennington's going to win this one, man. So we're taking Raquel Pennington by uh, unanimous decision. 
Tough fight to pick indeed. I just like the way Aldana's put it together. I think she's on the rise in this one and uh, cruises to a unanimous decision in this one as well. All right. Headlining the televised prelims. We got some veteran featherweight fights fighters here. Bruce Leroy, Alex Caceres is a minus 150 favorite against Steven Ocho Peterson, plus 130. I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Big Marcel. You start things out here. Yeah, Bruce Leroy, who doesn't know him from The Ultimate Fighter, I think season 12, if I'm correct, could also be 14. I always mix those up. No, um, 12, you're right. George St. Pierre's team. Yeah, exactly. He always came up with that uh, yellow Bruce Lee, uh, uh, how do you say that, costume? So, jumpsuit, yeah. Jumpsuit, yeah. Sorry, man. Sometimes, guys, I can't find the English words, but uh, we have Max for that to correct me, so thanks, man. Um, yeah, last fight, Kron Gracie, very quick uh, uh, submitted uh, by Kron. Fight before, Martin Bravo was at the, the ultimate fighter finale. That was a close decision. It could, could have gone both ways, in my opinion. Um, then we have Steven Peterson, who, who needs a win here, man, because uh, his last fight, he lost to Luis Pena. Um, I was actually, I'm happy for him, but I was actually surprised he got another fight. Uh, but I think because Pena was uh, was too heavy, they, they give him another one. But he needs to win this one, man, because uh, otherwise he's going one and three. Um, such a tough fight, man. I think on the ground, Caceres can, can edge out a unanimous decision, but stand up, Peterson can catch him. But I don't see Caceres getting knocked, knocked out that quick. So I'm taking Bruce Leroy by unanimous decision probably here. Bruce Leroy. You want to guess how old he is, Big Marcel? I think he's definitely older than me, and I'm I'm 29, so I think he's 32. He is 30 years old. He is only 30 years old, considering he's been in the UFC for uh, like 10 years now. It's pretty crazy. Um, he's older than me, so <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the loss last time out, two and four in his last six. Ocho Peterson out of Fortis MMA, one and two in the UFC. We both picked him in that fight against Luis Pena, but. Um, Granted, Pena did miss weight badly. You mentioned that, but came up on the wrong side of the decision there. Just a gritty heads down type of fighter. Um, and while I see Caceres with that speed advantage, I don't know. I like I like Peterson's aggression in this one to find a way to to win on the judges' scorecards. I'm taking Ocho by a unanimous decision in this one. So after starting off three three of the same, we got four straight differences. Big Marcel. So I'm I'm curious to see how this one's going to shake out. <laughs> All right, well, we go to the main card and kicking things off in the main card. Somehow these two heavyweights, you would think, between all their years of experience and big-time fights would be in the rankings, but neither of them are. Uh, ben Rothwell taking on Andre Orlovsky. Rothwell minus 185. Andre Orlovsky plus 160. Rothwell coming off that controversial loss after a near three-year layoff to Blagoy Ivanov, a uh, decision that Big Marcel granted me as my early Christmas gift uh, as Ivanov won that one, and I picked him in there. Um, we know he's well-rounded. We know he's got skilled hands, high fight IQ. Arlovsky, meanwhile, uh, this guy might just be on the UFC roster until he's 80. I mean, we know he's got a strong relationship with uh, Dana White and the UFC brass. Just re-upped for another UFC contract despite losing four straight and being 2-9 and nine in his last 11. Um, coming off a split decision last time out, but yet gets resigned for the heavyweight division. Uh, Big Marcel, before you break this down, I want another Ben Rothwell laugh. <laughs> there it is. So, um, man, somebody <laughs> told me, uh, uh, what is that, two days ago, like uh, they will keep Andre Aloski around until his nose is uh, straight again. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be laughing. Um, yeah, what can we say, man? Andrea Lusky is on a on a four fight not winning streak and on a, th a three losing in his last four against Sakai. That was uh, 50 50. I think he could have won and maybe should have won that one. Uh, ben Rothwell, sorry Drake, I didn't agree. I don't agree with you that uh, even enough won, but I think Rothwell got robbed in that one bad, in my opinion. I already had my ho 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 tweet uh, ready, and then I had to delete it because it didn't make sense, right? So um, yeah, this is this a fun fight, man. It's between two guys uh, who have done this uh, many many times. It's a rematch actually from uh, 2008 where. Uh, where Arlovsky won in the, in the third round against uh, Ben Rothwell. 
Um, but I'm taking Rothwell this this time, man. I think Rothwell's going to do it probably by by a knockout in the first round or a unanimous decision. One of those two. I think a knockout yeah. or a unanimous decision. I forgot about that first fight. That was under the infliction banner, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, I forgot. I completely forgot about that one. Um, but yeah, I like Rothwell here too. I think he's way more skilled at this point and has more left in the tank. Give me Rothwell unanimous decision. Um, but man, that one has potential for fireworks, but also has a potential for not fireworks. Yeah, exactly. And and even Rothwell will let, let him kick in the N U T S if needed. You saw that in the last uh, fight against Ivanov. <laughs> Great moment. <laughs> You're too much, man. <laughs> All right. Lightweights on deck. Number 13 ranked Alexander the Great Hernandez is a minus 185 favorite against Masa Randuba, one of my favorite nicknames in the UFC, Francisco Trinaldo, plus 160. Fun fight here. Trinaldo, absolute veteran, man. Been in there. Kevin Lee, Evan Dunham, Jim Miller, James Vick, Paul Felder. I mean, this guy's fought a lot of tough competition inside the UFC octagon. Um, had that bout get scrapped with Diego Fajaya earlier this year, last minute. Um, meanwhile, Hernandez two and one in the UFC, and it'll be interesting to see how he answers that first UFC loss, that one to Donald Cowboy Cerrone in January. Um, but on paper, I like Hernandez to get it, get it right back into, into contention here and answer back. Well, I know Trinaldo is hard to finish, but the guy is old and you got to think Hernandez is just, it has him beat pretty much in the stand-up and the strength, the power, the speed. Big Marcel, are you seeing anything different? No, man. Best thing that ever could happen to Hernandez was losing to Cowboy, I think, because I think um, I know many people are like, yeah, you have to sell yourself, blah, 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 but you can do it a little bit too much, you know, and he got a little bit over himself, in my opinion, and uh, was like, I'm going to do this, and uh, he got he got short in that, he come up short in that one, but uh, he has the talent, man, he's good stand-up, his wrestling is pretty good, we saw it against Olivier Aubin Mercier, and uh, I think he's going to out-wrestle Trinaldo and uh, probably beat him up on the ground, and uh, taking uh, home the TKO win in the first or second round by uh, ground and pound. I got a TKO as well, but I think he's going to land one of those big bombs on the feet and get him out of there. Give me a, a second round KO for the great. Then I take well. the first. Then I take the first. Take third? No, the first. <laughs> oh, the first. Huh? Yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> All right. Another set of fun lightweights on deck here. James Vick, Tex executioner, sitting at 15 in the rankings. He is a slight underdog against the unranked Dan Hooker, the hangman, minus 140. Really hard fight to pick here, and that's why I'm going to turn it over to you, Big Marcel. Get things started here. I don't think really is a hard fight to pick for me, man. I think uh, James Vick, he has looked solid, man, but his last two outings, there are some fighters, you know, I, I really like James Vick. I think he's a great dude. I think he has some good technique, but sometimes they are talking themselves so much up that they really think that they are better than they actually are. Like I said, with Alexander Hernandez, and I think it's the same thing with Jane Fick. But at the same time, it's the same thing with Daniel Hooker, in my opinion, who was like uh, acting like he was uh, all that. And then he came <clears throat> up short against Edson Barboza, which is absolutely no, nothing bad about because Edson Barboza is a world-class guy and is a world-class fighter. But uh, everybody was like, he's going to beat Edson Barboza and all that. And I really didn't saw that. And uh, I think uh, Hooker, very tough. Um, man, I... I think both guys will have to uh, made adjustments, but I see Hooker winning this one. Man. I think uh, Hooker is much more, uh, how do you say that, uh, uh, light on the feet. He can pick his shots, and I think he will probably uh, land a big a, a big hook or a big kick on Vic, and I think uh, he will put Vic out in the second round. He's going to land a big right hooker? Is that what you just said? Oh, man. <laughs> Who's too much here? <laughs> Sorry, that I apologize. I I just should not have done that one. But oh, no, it was, that was funny. I like it. <laughs> it was just it was too easy right there. Um, okay, James Vick, thirteen and three overall, nine and three in the UFC. But you mentioned the two losses, Justin Gaethje and Paul Felder. Very close fight. That Felder fight was great striking. Really uses the length well and the reach. Um, but man, he is huge for that weight class. So you got to think that this weight that weight cut's going to start wearing on him. Um, the Hangman Dan Hooker. You mentioned the four fight win streak. Stopped in the third round by Edson Barbosa. No shame in that, but that is uh, one of the few wins that Barbosa has been able to pick up in his in recent years. Um, 
Still only 29, though, but I actually like Vic in this one. I think he's got better skills on the feet, and I think he's able to keep Hooker at range. Um, I don't see him getting landed, getting a big bomb dropped on him like Justin Gaethje did. Uh, I got the Tex executioner getting it done in his home state via decision. Okay. Now we're talking about weight cups. What did you think about the Aspen Lot situ situation last Saturday, Friday? Interesting topic, and they actually discussed it on Between the Links as well. Um, that it was definitely hard to see that that uh, see her at the way and see the way she was trembling and whatnot. But something I Aspen Lad used to make 125, and now she's struggling to make 135. Granted, she's very young, still developing um, as far as her, you know, as far as her actual physical appearance, but. I don't know. It's it seems like she's got some things to work on, and and perhaps linking up with uh, the right strength and nutrition and and um, strength and conditioning and everything might do her wonders. And I expect her to come back much more uh, peak and shredded and and ready for her next fight at one thirty five. I don't foresee another weight cut issue. Man, How about you? So. Yeah, man. I hope so. I mean, she's still so so young and. She struggles lately with the, also with her UFC debut. She struggled, if I remember correctly. And um, man, yeah, I mean, and had that fight get canceled against Sajar Eubanks too, right? The first time, yeah. Or no, also just guy, just guy. That's right. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's. I mean, at that age, already so much difficulties with weight cutting, man. I mean, it's gonna wear on you later, later. Uh, how do you say that in later years in MMA? So. I hope she can uh, she can turn it around, but uh, if not, and she, for example, has to go to 145, the UFC has a legit somebody already there at 145, I think. But the UFC should really uh, build that division more, man. I mean, why should you have 140? Why should you have four 145ers around? You know, and there are more. They have signed two more. And remember when they fought when uh, they had Bea Malaki against uh, Dude, Santana. Santana? Why was that abandoned weight, man? You know? Good question, man. But sorry, the I'm things that go topic, behind. But, both... uh, yeah. No, 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 no. Always, always fun to discuss the nuances of the sport. But uh, two guys who have less problems with weight cutting. I, although not a great transition there. Uh, heavyweight <laughs> bout on deck. Juan Adams, the chosen Juan, the Kraken Adams, taking on Greg Hardy, former NFL All Pro uh, tackle there. Adams is a slight favorite, minus 150. Hardy, minus 105. Hardy, we know the story. He's 4-1 and one in his pro career, 1-1 one and one in the UFC, but facing the true bottom of the division in terms of competition. I mean, Dmitry Smolyakov was not even on the roster prior to their fight. Um, Adams, meanwhile, has been calling for this fight for a while. He is 5-1, and one, also 1-1 one and one in the UFC, recently suffering his first pro loss to Arjun Singh Buller, who now... Uh, hot route out of the UFC. He is now in one championship, so didn't even re-sign off the win. Um, Adams, we know he needs to work on his striking, but he's very tough. Former Division One wrestler, Greg Hardy, we know the book on him. Big heavy hands, working an American top team. Big Marcel, how do you see this one shaking? Yeah, man, um, it's hard, actually, because Greg Hardy, like you said, he's, he really faced the bottom of the competition so far. Dmitry Smolyakov. Or the lifeguard, he's uh, gonna fight and fight House Global soon. Um, the lifeguard, yeah. <laughs> oh man, I don't like to like to uh, laugh about fighters, but man, come on, that, he had like probably the three worst performances I ever saw in the octagon. Um, Juan Adams, um, yeah, he, he's he's a he's a character man. Um, I think he has a, he has a good future in the UFC. Uh, we saw his fight against Arjun Bula. Which I think was close. I don't know how you saw very it. Close. Yeah, very it was close. Yeah, very close. And on the when they break down the stats and the numbers, Adams had him pretty much outstruck the whole the whole fight. Yeah. So man, I think um, I think Adams can win this one, man. And if he's just smart, he tries to take him down and he he, he gonna ground and pound on him. I think that's the smart thing to do. Really do that. I know there's so much emotion involved for Adams in this one for for some reason. And um, yeah, but I have to take uh, Juan Adams. I think if I take him in the first round, TKO, ground and pound. There you have it, boom, boom. I uh, I'm with you. I think Adams is a very dangerous heavyweight on top, and uh, he knows how to use that weight well. 
Can he get that fight there? That's going to be a big question heading into it, but I think he ultimately does. He survives the kind of the early swarm from Hardy attempt, and he gets this fight to the ground and and uh, grinds out a victory. TKO, second round for the chosen one out of Houston. Doesn't he uh, cut down from 290, I heard? Yeah, and actually a recent interview with um, John Hyanko, JHK MMA, he, he said he actually did not balloon up quite as big in between this fight camp, only up to about 280. Uh, okay. But still, cuts down to make that 265 limit. Yeah. yeah. See, my original joke was two guys who don't need to cut weight, and then I remembered Juan Adams actually yeah. does cut weight to <laughs> make every weight. <laughs> That's why I had to laugh <laughs> when you <he> said that. <laughs> Whatever. All right. I don't think these next two, though, need to cut weight. Boom. Gross. Walt Harris taking on Alexi Olenek in the heavyweight division of UFC San Antonio's co-main event. Harris is at minus... Uh, 145 on the betting line. The comeback on the boa constrictor plus 125. Harris sitting at 14 in the rankings. Olenek number nine. Olenek coming off that TKO loss to Alistair Overeem. Um, we know who is one of the best heavyweights in the world, but at the same time, we know Olenek, his bread and butter is that Ezekiel choke. He snatches that neck better than pretty much anyone. Um, meanwhile, the big ticket, Walt Harris, great nickname, um, unbeaten in his last three, seems to be clicking right now, and we know we know he's got the big power in the left hand. Um, but I'm really glad this fight got rebooked. It's a solid test for both at this stage in their UFC career. Uh, big Marcel, heavyweights in the co-main event of the evening. What's going to happen? Um, yeah, I always like it when heavyweights is in the co-main event and not in the main event because we don't get five rounds. Um if it, if, because if it's heavyweight and we got five rounds, nine out of ten times it's boring. So yeah, um, unless it's Francis and Ghana, who doesn't even take a minute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Last three main events, average of forty-seven seconds per fight. You know that's that's crazy. Something. Actually. All right. Yeah. So uh, Alexio Lednik, like you said, Mister Ezekiel Choke. Um, Lost his last fight against Overeem, but uh, he actually only lost against pretty good competition lately, man. Overeem Blades, and uh, then then against Omi Lanchuk, which is uh, which has been like three years ago, I think. Uh, that was actually on Wednesday, I think, because I remember it. <laughs> so um, Walt Harris um, lo- won his last fight against uh, Sergei Spivak, which Spivak really didn't look like he had any business in the octagon that night. Um, yeah. My gut feeling says Olenek is going to take this, man. I think uh, Harris looked good lately, but uh, I don't see. Uh, maybe he lands a good punch, but then he follows up on the ground and Olenek <laughs> kind of choke him, man. I think that's going to happen. If it's not a, if it's not Ezekiel choke, maybe a rear naked choke. But uh, man, Alexi Olenek, give me him a submission in the first or second round. I can see the scenario you just painted out happening 100%. I, mm-hmm. I I'm, happy I'm not talking uh, bullshit in that case. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, I could very much see that. Harris hurting him, jumping into the guard, boom, Ezekiel choke, out of there. But for me, this is Walt Harris's game seven. He really needs to take this time to prove he can be up there towards the top 10 of the division. Um, the guy had that chance against Fabricio Verdum, submitted in what, a little over a minute. It was a pretty tough, tough performance. And then had the the deal with Mark Godbeer where he ended up um, getting disqualified, even though probably should have won that fight too. really knocked down all the momentum he had. This is the chance he has to really propel himself up towards the top of the division. I know he was supposed to originally fight Justin Willis in this one, um, but now he gets, gets the rebooking against Olenek. I just see the big ticket land in the big left hand and Olenek just not able to answer back. So give me Walt Harris in this one. TKO late in the first round. Um, but hey, if Olin gets another Ezekiel choke, that would be no surprise to me whatsoever. It's time for the main event of the evening. Five rounds in the UFC's welterweight division between ranked opposition Rafael Dos Anjos, the former UFC lightweight champion, sitting at number four in the rankings. Even money underdog in this one against Leon Rocky Edwards, number 12. Awesome bout at the top of the bill here. Dos Anjos, former lightweight champion, former interim welterweight title challenger, 
back in the win column over Kevin Lee after back-to-back -back losses to the current and former champions and Kamaru Usman and Colby Covington. Leon Edwards, seven-fight win streak, 9-2 and two in the UFC overall. Uh, one of those losses to Kamaru Usman, one in his UFC debut to Claudio Silva, who is also unbeaten in the UFC, I believe. Um, only two finishes in those seven bouts, though, for, for Leon Rocky Edwards. This will be a true test on whether he can contend. Um, also, one to look at, this is five rounds. We know he's had some tendencies to fade late in fights. Uh, my pick is Leon Rocky Edwards by unanimous decision. Big Marcel, break down the main event of this evening. I absolutely disagree with you in this one. I think uh, I think Leon Edwards, he has, uh, he has the momentum, but uh, Rafael Dos Anjos, dude, I mean, he lost against Kamaru Usman and against Colby Covington, but those two are arguably the two or at least top three in the division. Um, Leon Edwards, he has some good he – got, he got some good wins, man. I mean, Luke Barberina, Cerrone, Nelson – some good wins, but um, he's not going to win a five-rounder against RDA, or he has to catch him in the first or second round with a, with a punch, which is not going to happen because Leon Edwards personally also like to uh, wrestle himself a little bit more than he likes the stand-up game, although he uh, knocked out Seth Basinski, if I remember correctly, a few years ago in Poland. But uh, nah, man, RDA all the way. Submission win, second round. Give me RDA. RDA. Second round. round. Wow. Yeah, RDA is going to win this one, man. I'm I'm convinced he's going to win this one. Also, pick him for uh, performance of the night already. There you have it, RDA. Write All it right. down, write it down, RDA. Performance of the night, 100%. <laughs> is he your underdog pick too? You want to leave him at that? RDA, 100%. <laughs> All right. Big Marcel, give us your other performance of the night bonus uh, while you're at it. Uh, my other performance of the night bonus. Let's go with uh, the great Alexander Hernandez. Okay. Uh, since you did two, I will give mine, and then I will give the other two, and then you will finish it up. So, performance of the night bonuses. This is tough. I'm going to go with Hernandez as well, and then give me Sam Alvey. I don't know. I just got a feeling uh, he's going to get it done there. Um, for my underdog pick of the evening... Man, uh, my options are Roxanne Modafferi, Sam Alvey, Steven Peterson, James Vick, um, or that's it. I will take, uh, give me Vick, underdog. Smart pick. Yeah. All right. Lock and fight of the night here. Lock, I am going to go with, give me Domingo Pilarte. I like the way he matches up in that fight. And fight of the night bonus out to let's go James Vick and Daniel Hooker. All right, Big Marcel, you got a lock of the night and you need a fight of the night. Lock of the night, RDA. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> had to do it, right? Had to do it. Yep. Uh, fight of the night. Let's go crazy. Mario Bautista, Jen, Jen Susan. You know, that's not that crazy to think about. Both have high high octane styles. Jin Susan is a maniac, like we said. That that could very well be fight of the night. Yeah. All right. So let's recap these picks before we get out of here. Starting off the early evening, Domingo Pilarte. We are both taking him to get it done over Felipe Colaris. Both taking Jin Susan over Mario Bautista. Both taking Ray Borg over. Gabriel Silva split on this next one. I have Roxanne Modafferi. Big Marcel has Jennifer Maya. Both have it by a split decision. Split on this next one. I have Sam Alvey, the veteran. He's got Clidson Farias de Abreu. Split on the next one. I got Irene Irene Aldana. He's got Raquel Pennington. Split on the prelims headliner as well. I'm taking Ocho Peterson. He's got Bruce Leroy, Alex Caceres. Both taking Ben Rothwell to get it done against Andre Olovsky. Both have Alex Hernandez back on track over Francisco Trinaldo. I'm taking James Vick as an underdog. Big Marcel's got the hangman, Dan Hooker. Both taking Juan Adams to hand Greg Hardy his first true UFC loss. Uh, both have... No, we are split on this next one. I'm taking the big ticket, Walt Harris. Big Marcel's got Mr. Ezekiel Choke, Alexi Olenek to do what he does best. And then in the main event of the evening, my co-host is so confident that Rafael Dos Anjos is going to walk away with the win over Leon Rocky Edwards. I am taking Leon Rocky Edwards to get it done by a decision. 
Big Marcel, all in on Rafael Dos Anjos. He is his lock pick of the night. He is his underdog pick of the night. And he is one of his performance bonus winners. His other performance bonus winner is Alexander Hernandez and his fight of the night, Mario Bautista and Jin Su San. My lock of the night is Domingo Pilarte in the opening bout. I am taking James Vick as my underdog tech executioner, getting it done in the state of Texas. My fight of the night is Vick and Daniel Hooker. Performance of the night bonuses going out to Hernandez and Sam Alvey, smiling Sam. Big Marcel, final thoughts, feedback on UFC San Antonio. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it, man. I mean, uh, Saturday is the beginning of my two weeks vacation, so uh, let's make it great with uh, opening with fights, you know. You going anywhere for vacation? No, I have nothing planned, man. Maybe a day or two days some, somewhere, but I have nothing planned. I'm not a real planner. So, uh, yeah. Well, if you ever find yourself in Chicago, you got a place to stay. Okay, thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> Just want to remind everyone to subscribe to the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. All the great shows can be found there on all the podcast mediums. Big Marcel, where can the people find and follow all your great work? MMADNA.nl. It's a Dutch website. Um, MMADNA on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can follow me on Big Marcel24 on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, I'll reply to you if uh, if I see you asking me something. So uh, that's always cool. And there is no one out there that does better with fight announcements than Big Marcel. I mean, just so easy to follow. You see the big picture of who's fighting. You got all the details below. He does it all for you. You don't even need to go research it on your own. You just open up Twitter. You open up Instagram. Big Marcel's done all the work for you. Um, so highly recommend following him. The great work in MMA DNA. Big Marcel, you know what I love? When someone else will post the matchup or like talk about the matchup and they'll copy and paste your picture that has the MMA DNA <laughs> logo in it <laughs> to opponents. <laughs> I like that as well. It's like, all right, you clearly didn't make that image yourself. <laughs> Straight copy. Copyright infringement there. Ah, it's no problem, man. It's all cool. <laughs> you can you can follow me on uh, Twitter at trademark MMA. Uh, please subscribe to the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in, and we will be back after this fight week for UFC 240. That's is that next weekend, Big Marcel? Yeah, the following. Yeah, that's next weekend. Next weekend, big fight card there in Canada, I believe. So uh, that should be a fun one. Thank you, everyone. Take care and see you next week.